Dave Dvorkin, who's curator of astronomy at the Smithsonian Institute downtown Washington. He's a good friend of Novak and almost Heaven Star Party. He's been here you know, at least three, four times already. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have to twist his arm to come. He sort of volunteered, uh, even after having spoken to Novak just a few months ago. But he always has something different to talk about. Tonight he's going to talk about George Carruthers and the first observatory on the moon. I'll let him describe those details. Uh, he came up just for this event, just to give this talk, so we, we really appreciate the effort he went through to be here. So please let's welcome Dr. Dvorkin. And, uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you, everybody, for organizing this. This has really been one of the warmest uh, receptions uh, over the past years, um, both temperature-wise and personality-wise. <laughs> so I'm always delighted. Um, I will say, I have to say that given what uh, the, uh, the um, logistics here, I'm going to whoop, read it right side up. Uh, this is a uh, research that is ongoing. It is not finished yet. Uh, there's a lot of poignant issues to it. But I want to just start to get you in the frame of mind um, that I hope I can get you into. How many of you built your first telescope before you were 10? One. Anybody else? Okay, the person I'm talking about tonight did and started winning prizes uh, with them. And so it'll really be quite something. Now. Uh, I have been uh, interested in, as I'm, I will say later on, the origins of the space sciences. I've written several books on it in different uh, places, and um, uh, I am uh, continuing to ho hopefully um, uh, preserve the record of the space sciences as they change from generation to generation. Um, just to give you an example, the zeroth order of space scientists uh, none of them, none of them uh, actually pursued science in the areas they were trained in. They pursued science in areas that they had expertise for building instruments for that could survive on rockets and missiles. Now, is that a bad thing? No. It is an interesting observation in terms of how the problems uh, were addressed. And the institution that uh, I'm talking about tonight, the Naval Research Lab, how many have heard of the Naval Research Lab? Good, good. Because this is uh, the book that I wrote that came out in 92, which is called Science with a Vengeance, uh, which is a play on words, of course, for the V2 rocket. Um, uh, one of the major players was the Naval Research Lab with their zeroth generation space scientists, the people who said, there's a rocket, what are we going to do with it? But tonight, I'm going to be looking at the second and third generations of space scientists. And um, the person that fascinates me most and fascinated me for a long time uh, is George Carruthers. Uh, and so I've been interviewing him over the past years, starting in the late 80s through the early 90s. We've done uh, video uh, histories of him. And so just to get you all in the mood, I would like to have you play this is a, a short clip, three, a little over three, four minutes, uh, based upon uh, the interviews that I took in the early 90s of George and also in his laboratory. Um, because at that time, um, he and his uh, group of people who were trying to promote science literacy in the DC schools wanted something inspirational. And so this is one of the things we put together uh, sort of a homegrown uh, production, not exactly 60 minutes or 6 o'clock news. But have a look, and uh, it will take you back and, and get you in the right place. Uh, and that place is the moon and Apollo 16. Go ahead, run it. They are mysterious and unknown decoy. Island planes. Apollo 16 is going to change your image. Young set up an ultraviolet camera to provide the first astronomical observations from the moon. That's George's camera. He took pictures of the Earth's upper atmosphere and magnetosphere and their interaction with the solar wind. He also photographed the interstellar gas present throughout space and the ultraviolet halos that appear around galaxies. 
Astronomers have long wanted a telescope on the moon. Perhaps this experiment would show the moon an ideal base for future astronomical observations. NASA trained its astronauts to set up and use instruments like the moon camera and to conduct space research for scientists on Earth. But who built the moon camera? The first astronomical telescope set up on another celestial body. The moon camera that flew on Apollo 16 was conceived and built by astrophysicist George Carruthers of the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. When I uh, was a child, about nine years old, I first became interested in spaceflight by reading a Buck Rogers comic book. And I later became interested in astronomy and uh, actually built my own telescope. Uh, about 1950, I came across some articles in Collier's Magazine in which Dr. Werner von Braun and his associates were proposing to build a space station and have manned expeditions to the moon and to Mars. And that's when I really became interested in spaceflight and astronomy as a career. George Carruthers' interest eventually led him to the University of Illinois, where he studied astrophysics. After receiving his doctorate, he came to the Naval Research Laboratory, where he has worked ever since, as a leader in using optical and electronic technologies in space discovery. After the lunar lander landed on the moon, the astronauts took this off of the lunar module and set it up in the shadow of the lunar module. The first thing they had to do was It's been over two decades since Carruthers' camera was taken to the moon. Here Carruthers, using a backup model, explains to university student Garland Dixon how the camera worked. Spectroscopy mode, the whole camera assembly rotates 90 degrees to the vertical position. The first thing they had to do was to establish the coordinate system. So they set it up and uh, sighted down sun so they could find out where the shadow of the lunar module was. And then they used this azimuth circle and set the down sun position to be zero degrees on this azimuth angle here and then they locked that into place. Then, in order to further correct the system, they had to sight on the Earth because they knew where the Earth was supposed to be and they could make corrections based on that. So they sighted through this site over here which was specifically designed to sight on the Earth. And from that point on, the people in Houston could call up the corrections to the coordinates so that the astronaut could then point to all of the targets that we wanted to see with accuracy of better than a degree or two. Houston, the Earth is uh, maybe a... Uh, the Earth is, is uh, maybe a quarter. It's right in the middle. Outstanding. You did a good job. John Young. The NRL moon camera the first astronomical telescope placed on another celestial body was built by an African-American who since childhood had two dreams, to be an astronomer and to become involved with space research. Today, George Carruthers has met both those goals and helps others learn how to turn knowledge and experience into their own life's dreams. So we're ready to go ahead with camera assembly. Okay, that's it. We had a wonderful time back in the 90s uh, putting these programs together partly for a, um, a group in DC called Project SMART, uh, which was science, mathematics, art, uh, and I forget the R and the T. But part of it was to uh, bring uh, DC school uh, kids into laboratory situations and give them a role in uh, analyzing something or working on things. And as I'll point out, uh, the opportunity came uh, for uh, restoring the backup camera, the identical one to w that went to the moon uh, in the 90s. Uh, we had one in our collection and it needed some TLC. What better? than to have George Carruthers bring in students uh, and go through those, uh, th that activity. So tonight I just want to talk a little bit about George himself. Uh, George is, is still alive um, uh, with his family. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether he's in Chicago or back in Washington. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, family issues, 
uh, and, and we're all wishing George well. Um, and uh, it's with the understanding that he is still alive uh, that uh, gives this um, uh, talk, at least for me personally, uh, a lot of poignancy. And, and I hope that uh, you appreciate that. I feel kind of sensitive about it since um, uh, I am essentially uh, planning a biography. Uh, which is still quite a ways off because half of the material is classified. Mm. <laughs> how, how old is he about? He's 79, a little bit older than me. And uh, uh, what really amazed me is that uh, as I started interviewing him, I do oral histories, uh, which are far less formal than video histories, as you can well imagine. And in the oral history, I, I thought I was, I was listening to myself because all of the same things in the late 40s and the early 50s that, that inspired him. So let's move on to uh, looking at George. Oh, I'm the clicker. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. He was born in Cincinnati, 1939. Now his father was a civil engineer and there was sort of an aviation connection. Uh, he worked at Wright Pat Air Force Base. Um, I have been trying to find records on, on his father, but so far uh, no, nothing comes up, so he was not a high-level person. He didn't publish, and so he was an engineer of, of some sort, so that tells you something. And his mother was a clerk in the U.S. Postal Service. Um, now, uh, the family moved from uh, Cincinnati to Milford, Ohio. Um, um, early and very early in George's life, and it was a, a sort of a rural area, and so he got, he got into sort of a farm life and uh, was not uh, exposed to, let's say, the pressures of a large city. But uh, his father died in 1951, which was a uh, terrible disrupt for the family, uh, and they uh, uprooted from Ilford and moved to Chicago where his mother's family was based. But by that time, George had already made his first telescope. He read voraciously, he read uh, popular mechanics type books, and he found a magazine article about how to build your own telescope with little lenses and everything and putting them in a uh, toilet paper tube. I mean, when he was telling me this, I was getting shivers down my spine, you know. I did the same thing, only I did it with uh, my father's liberated optics from Germany. Uh, so it was bigger than a toilet paper tube. But it was the same sort of feeling. And then looked at the sky with it and simply enjoyed it. Uh, now, both of his father and mother went to college. One of his uncles had a PhD in literature. Uh, and this gives you a sense that, that they were uh, very, very middle class in their, in their outlook. And I'm still trying to find out more about the family and how it was that his, his uh, uncle um, uh, was um, an intellectual at that time, and it was unusual at that time. The family experienced some discrimination, both in Milford, uh, but more in Chicago. Now, I'm not going to be talking about that tonight. I want to talk about the astronomy and what inspired George, uh, because I still have a lot of work to do uh, beyond that. George, very, um, his work in school was um, actually not that distinguished in the formal stuff, but he was a self-starter. He was a hands-on guy. He is a hands-on guy, sh I should say. And very soon he started winning uh, prizes and awards. And one of the neatest things uh, is his, he became fascinated uh, as a high school senior with rocketry. And this picture is not really good enough, but you can see uh, an integral sign there, F, D, T equals, and stuff like that. This is part of uh, uh, predicting, not predicting, but measuring the thrust on a rocket motor. And here is a device that he had that he built and won a prize for, uh, for uh, uh, generating you know, these little rocket motors. And he was in a club. It was a black club, uh, black, uh, black colleagues uh, from Englewood High School, which was a South Side High School in Chicago, um, making these amazing things, winning science contests. So he certainly did distinguish uh, himself and was very, very uh, anxious, uh, a a um, active in the key being hands-on operations. Um, he also um, and I know this from my stay in Chicago, too. Uh, if you're living on the south side, and I was in the University of Chicago area, 
uh, it's not hard to get to the Adler Planetarium. The only question is, how, which bus do you take? So it was quite, uh, it, it, from the beginning, George started um, going to the Adler, and the Adler was very forthcoming uh, with making telescope making accessible to kids. Now this is from 1960, and that's well after George graduated, but he made his first reflector at uh, the Adler. It was a six inch uh, uh, mirror, and the instructor, uh, Rich Meunier, right there, I believe, um, uh, who is legendary as a, as a teacher of, uh, for telescope making, um, uh, was his, I believe, his, his instructor. I'm not absolutely sure about that. But, so he was definitely making telescopes and launching rockets at the same time. Now, that is amazing because I have to say, I, I know uh, kids who did one or the other. I know very few of my age, at least, that did both. So he, he clearly uh, was an enthusiast. Uh, when in, in, in high school, uh, he chose the University of Illinois, uh, which is, of course, where his father went. Um, and um, uh, he chose it, too, in engineering. But he decided he tried to go into what he called astronautical engineering. And I asked him about that. It didn't really exist at that time. He was trying to create a discipline. He wanted to do hands-on work, but he was crazy about astronomy. And so he kind of put them together in, in his own mind, and I thought that was, that was very good. He, he pr also pursued graduate work at the University of Illinois, earning his master's degree in nuclear engineering in 62, and his PhD in what was actually called aeronautical and astronautical engineering in 1964. And by then, he also had quite a bit of work experience. Uh, he worked as a research and teaching assistant studying plasmas and gases. And again, I need to do more work to find out uh, was this necessary for him to be able to stay in school, you know, and to support the family and that sort of thing. These are the kinds of questions you ask in a biography. And I hope to be able to uh, be developing that. Well, uh, George learned, let's see, about a, a postdoctoral program uh, when he was getting his, his PhD uh, in the aerospace sciences at the Naval Research Laboratory, which you, most of you have heard of. Um, and he applied for that program and he was accepted into Herb Friedman's rocketry group, which included X-ray astronomy, UV astronomy, aeronomy, and solar physics. In his, when I asked him about it, quoting from his oral history, I wanted hands-on experience building instruments for space flight. And that was it. That's what motivated him, being able to solve a problem. And uh, we'll talk about the problem he chose, or in a way, he chose for him, because he was a member of a team. The NRL people is, in my studies, uh, they, some of them worked as individuals, but most of them, the ones who were most successful, looked to see how can I contribute to the team. What is my special expertise, and how can I make the goals of the team work? And that was the NRL view in, uh, under Friedman's group. Uh, under Towsey's group in, in optical uh, UV spectroscopy, uh, you might say it was similar. Uh, I've interviewed them as a group as well, and I got that dynamic. And that's a very, very interesting observation about how different groups uh, develop to uh, solve big problems. The rationale for the postdoctoral program was actually pretty, pretty interesting. Um, this is an NRC, National Research Council, report from the 1980s reviewing what it was like. And I can tell you, I was a, um, I was a rising uh, junior, senior, you know, in, in, the, in the mid, uh, mid 60s. Um, and uh, uh, recruiters from industry were literally coming by in their sports cars to take us to lunch. They, they, there was such a need for technically trained people at that time that it was, it was really um, uh, uh, an amazing inducement. I chose not to do it. Um, I went to Lick Observatory instead, uh, but most of my, my colleagues, and there were about 15 people in my class, uh, they chose astrodynamics and they went to work for TRW or, or Aerospace Corporation, stuff like that, and doing just fine as far as I know. But uh, this was happening all over the place, and there were not enough students. And so this is why Friedman uh, developed this postdoctoral program. But there's another characteristic to his program 
that was very, very different uh, than many, many programs like this uh, at, at different universities. And that was Friedman really, really was concerned about diversity. And I'm still working on this aspect, but from interviews of Friedman, and I think, I, oop, oop, what did I do? Okay, there's Friedman on the right, Herb Friedman. Um, he was a leading, leading X-ray astronomer. Uh, in the world, but also leading in producing a certain type of detector that was absolutely essential for X-ray work uh, that he used for all sorts of things, uh, mainly military. And that's how, as he told me when I interviewed him, he gained his equity in the Navy. Uh, his Geiger counters were so uh, good at detecting radiation uh, in places like Project Rain Barrel, which was nuclear detest test detection, or in studying the, the integrity and thickness of a battleship hull. Uh, any application you could think of, I mean, Herb was, was, the, was the, the hammer looking for nails, and he was really good. I inspected all of his lab notebooks at NRL, and it's just marvelous to see how many different places he thought he could use his Geiger counters. So that gave him a whole lot of equity. But uh, he went to Johns Hopkins uh, in the late 30s, and uh, he was advised as a Jew that he would not get a job in industry, which is where he wanted to go, in metallurgy primarily. And uh, he tried, and they wouldn't even interview him. They wouldn't even interview people who had co-authored with him because they were expected to be Jewish. Um, and it went on that way. Finally, Hermann Funt at Johns Hopkins, who had placed uh, students at various places in Washington, D.C. said, I think a civil service job is your best bet. Even academe would be a problem. And so he placed her at NRL, and he was at NRL ever since. And he wanted to return the favor and make NRL as, as diverse as, uh, as, as possible. And so once he saw George at work, there was no question George was hired uh, uh, into the, uh, the regular staff and became uh, part of, at first, Herb's team, but then moved around to different teams, depending upon what instrument had to be built and what kind of expertise was required for building it. Well, here's one of Herb's detectors. This is a display at uh, uh, the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, it's Dulles facility out in uh, um, uh, Chantilly. Uh, I put um, uh, a whole array of, uh, of, of early Geiger counters and UV sensors out there, and uh, we sometimes give uh, floor talks about where they came from. But look at this thing. It's marvelous. It's a Geiger counter. Uh, let's see. If I want to make sure I use the right thing here. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Here is the, here is the diagram of it. Uh, here is the, uh, the cathode is the, is the skin. And the anode assembly is this wire, and there's, of course, a voltage difference. Uh, the x-rays come in here, and they produce a current, and uh, they, they move out to be measured. Now, what is unusual about this is that the, the anode is supported at both ends. And why is that? Because this thing went on a rocket. And those anodes are very, very, very thin, and they start vibrating, you know, with the vibration of the rocket. And that would create all sorts of anomalous things. So he created um, different types of detectors, and George was fascinated by this. But he wasn't that fascinated by X-ray. He wanted to do ultraviolet work, and he actually wanted to image in the ultraviolet from rockets, okay? So, um, or oh, just a few shots. Here's Talbot Chubb, one of Friedman's. Uh, 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 colleagues showing me, and there, we have long interviews of, of his showing me what is called a gas filling station at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, George inherited it from, from Friedman, and it's where you take those little tubes and you stick them into a circuit uh, that can feed gas and, and, and get a sense of how sensitive the thing is becoming to different forms of radiation. Uh, what is interesting is that even though George was trained at the University of Illinois, uh, he and brought his technique of developing lab instruments to NRL. Uh, he basically convinced everybody else that his techniques were better than the ones at NRL, and so those are the ones that are ongoing. So that's an indicator of how influential he was, and that's what Talbot was telling me in this in this interview. Now here's here's the uh, the object of interest. This is an Araby rocket. Ever hear of the Araby? Certainly, yeah. It's the most successful civilian, you might say, rocket. It uh, came from Aerojet, that's the Aero, 
and B, it came from the Bumblebee program, which was an anti-missile program just uh, during and after World War, War II, uh, put out by the Applied Physics Lab, uh, you know, just north of, of, of DC. The Araby, uh, partly designed by James Van Allen and others, was the first instrument to be designed to be um, friendly to scientific experiments. It was made out of aluminum and not steel. It was uh, made to be as stable as possible, but it had to be spin stabilized. So you had to devise experiments that could work with spin stabilization. The early Arabies were just spin stabilized, but the later ones uh, had pointing controls in here, servo control uh, devices that could point to objects in space, like, like the sun at first. And in fact, the first Lyman Alpha uh, spectra were taken with a pointing control activated rocket in 1951 uh, that was partly developed by uh, what became the Ball Corporation, if you've ever heard of them, a major, major contractor who were, at that time, they were the machine shop for uh, the University of Colorado Physics Department. Uh, but anyway, this point then, uh, by the 60s, uh, was, okay, you got a sounding rocket, it's good for about five minutes in space, you know, and then this thing deploys and it, and it can look, at, how can we make this work for faint objects? See, so, I mean, the sun is fine, you can take a fraction of a second photograph and whammo, you've got it. Uh, but what about stars? What about nebulae? Well, you know, you're not going to increase the exposure time from a sounding rocket. You're not going to be able to afford a satellite for everything you want to do. Sounding rockets are far cheaper than satellites. So what, what's left? You make the instrument as sensitive as possible. And that's what George was up to. He was looking at what the problems were and let's see, uh, oop, what happened? Okay. Help. Oh, okay. Okay. He said, photography is not sensitive enough. So I want to develop a way, and he didn't invent this idea, but he invented one of the best designs for increasing the efficiency of photography by converting photons into electrons and then accelerating those electrons and focusing them and recording them on electron, or I might say X-ray sensitive nuclear emulsions. And that was his camera that he developed here, a magnetically focused image tube using an internally collected mirror and a front surface photocathode. Now he wasn't the only one to develop these things. These had been first developed in the, uh, in the 1930s by a man named Lalamond and others, Jerry Crone and, uh, and others, had developed them. Lalamans was very, very powerful, but, but a little frustrating. In order to use it, to take an exposure with Lalamans' camera, well, after the exposure, you had to destroy the camera in order to get the film out. <laughs> and everybody used to say, oh, well, he's French. You'd, that's the way they would design something. And we're going to acquire our first Lalamand tube, because it was a revolution. It, it, in fact, its work uh, on the 120-inch at Lick Observatory in the late 60s uh, was the first time that uh, people could uh, resolve and study the turbulence in the cores of safer galaxies, which we now know are black holes. You know, okay. Uh, it was a step toward understanding black holes. Well, George at the very same time was saying, well, I want to make one of these things too, but Boy, if you put a Lalamon tube on a rocket, it would be destroyed. It's a big matrix of glass, okay? Not gonna work. So he produced this device that would survive on a rocket. That was the mechanical challenge, which he loved. Um, this is also um, early in 69, uh, an indicator that NRL was trying to position itself to build instruments that would not only work on rockets, but work on satellites and work on the moon, maybe even. And this was the year that George applied to NASA in response to an announcement of opportunity uh, to build a camera that could be used on the moon. That's the key. Because again, you have a situation where uh, your exposure times can't be too long. Uh, you want to be as efficient as possible because heavens, the astronauts have tons of things to do and they don't have enough time to take a two hour exposure. You know, five minutes, fine. So he developed several of these cameras. Here's one that is a, uses Schmidt optics with a corrector plate 
And then there's another one uh, called a short shield uh, device that did not have the corrector plate, uh, but was better for farther, uh, deeper in, in the ultraviolet. Uh, here's a version of it where you see the plane grading because uh, Carruthers was not doing imaging. He was doing spectra because he was after uh, what was going on. Oh, the, I should also say um, the big drive at the Naval Research Lab since the late 1940s was to get to Lyman Alpha and to be able to look at Lyman Alpha as closely as possible, to be able to monitor it where? In the upper atmosphere of the Earth because that people believed that that was a key to predicting ionospheric fade-outs. You know, that's a very important part. If you can't talk to the ships at sea, what good are you? And can you predict when you can talk? So this is where that kind of interest became very, very important. And so these are the instruments that George develops, spectra to look, to reach to the alignment alpha region and to study the Earth's atmosphere. Now in aronomy experiments, you send a rocket up and you sense the uh, alignment alpha there, but you're looking only locally. In a low Earth orbit kind of thing like the early OAOs, uh, again, it's just still low Earth orbit. What was needed was a global image of the Earth's image in Lyman alpha to see what was radiating in Lyman Alpha around the atmosphere of the Earth and where was this stuff? And that's what George set out to do. Uh, here's uh, with his all reflecting image converter. Uh, and th uh, this is the, um, uh, the short shield design here. Better UV pr penetration. And there of course is the same um, uh, 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 thing that we saw in the movie in the clip, but look how the Chicago newspaper described it. Uh, this is his thang. And I, uh, I, I see a number of people nodding knowledgeably, yes, and I've looked into this. First of all, uh, the, um, the newspaper there uh, is the um, Chicago Defender. And that was a black newspaper on the south side of Chicago, and it was famous. It was the most important uh, Chicago, um, or, or I should say, black newspaper, and its goal, its mission, was to communicate with us with what they perceived were southern blacks who were looking for a, uh, a home in the north. And using a term like thang, which is a southern, as I was told by several uh, experts, this is a southern term for thing. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything bad, it's just sound, you sound southern, as far as I can tell. But it was a welcome to the people, who, uh, to the readers. And it was a, almost a colloquial welcome. Now, I, I, I don't fully believe that yet. It's still anecdotal, but it's an interesting thing. And the irony is, George doesn't have a southern accent. George came from Ohio. And so, the, you know, that's, that's the media for you guys. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, but this instrument was really incredible instrument, and he adapted it uh, first for the sounding rockets. And here you can see how they would create a test chamber. There was an ultraviolet source on the left, that black tube. The, uh, the detector was inside the, uh, the cabinet itself. And uh, the Arabies that he was, he was shooting off became very successful in the late 60s, in 1970. Uh, it really positioned him beautifully to, uh, for an Apollo experiment. Look at this one paper. Uh, it had over uh, something like 179 uh, total uh, citations, uh, a big group of citations in the early 70s, and it continued to be important. And this is rocket observations of interstellar molecular hydrogen. Uh, and these are the Lyman resonance absorption bands, which are very sensitive to um, and indica indicative of physical conditions in interstellar space. So uh, very important stuff. And so he was very well positioned. And indeed, George uh, proposed, uh, you know, in the, in the Apollo thing. Now, uh, I am very, very excited because after asking NASA, asking NRL for the announcement of opportunity responses and trying to find them, they all say, well, okay, if you've got unlimited time and resources, go on down to Marshall Space Flight Center. There's a great big building filled with all of these things. We won't let you in, but maybe you can find them there. <laughs> okay. Well, it turns out Herb Friedman, I just learned this two weeks ago, as a, as a byproduct of preparing this talk, so thank you very, very much, 
Herb Friedman deposited his papers not with the federal government. He found a way around it, which is still wondering about. That's illegal. But he did at uh, the American Philosophical Society. And guess what? When you go through his papers, there's all of Carruthers' stuff is in there. Hmm. He obviously was following Carruthers very closely. So um, I'm trying to hire somebody to go up there unless I can uh, get permission to leave uh, the museum for a while. Um, don't, don't campaign on my behalf. Uh, no, right now we're going through a renovation process and I have to be available for uh, frustration and advice, you know, on a 24-7. But anyway, but I'm glad to be here. Now, George put in this, his proposal. It was almost instantly accepted. Okay? But he wasn't the only one to put in proposals, you can imagine. This was an announcement of opportunity in 1969 as Apollo 11, and this is the, the 50th anniversary. Everybody was suggesting I, things to do on the moon. And uh, so George wasn't alone. There was a fellow named Thornton Page. Anybody ever hear of Thornton? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. okay. I was his gopher at UCLA when he was a visiting professor there, and uh, he had just acquired the eye patch uh, through a very serious and debilitating car accident. Uh, but he, he was a very sweet guy, and he was still having trouble with his, his eye patch. It's not an affectation, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, well, this guy has a career that uh, was pretty amazing. Let's look at it. Uh, astrophysics is Chicago. Absolutely elite stuff. In, in war work, uh, he was at the Naval Ordnance Lab, and after that, he went into operations research, which we uh, uh, only can guess at what operations research is. But one of the public things he did is became a member of the Robertson Panel. Ever hear of the Robertson Panel? That was the UFO Air Force uh, uh, investigation in the early 50s. Oh. You're the ones that found nothing, okay? <laughs> uh, so, uh, he continued his own research on galaxies, galaxy clusters, but by the late 50s and 60s, he became very interested in space-related activities, writing popular pieces, a case for Apollo, popular writing educational work. He and his gifted wife, uh, Lou Williams uh, Page, uh, Lee, Lee Williams Page, sorry, um, wrote popular uh, books together and, and uh, books that everybody read. Uh, he got into satellite tracking, he trained astronauts, he had connections at Marshall Space Flight Center, he was a consultant for NASA. Uh, interesting, fascinating personality, you can see him there in a TV interview uh, uh, listening to Carl Sagan. Uh, they, they were in a way um, uh, arguing buddies uh, for TV. He would, uh, uh, mainly about UFO stuff and life in the universe and, and should we explore and all of those things, but it was all set up. They, they were good friends. Um, now, in 1969, in, in response to that announcement of opportunity, um, he also proposed to do celestial imaging from the surface of the moon. His very first proposal was huge, a 20-inch telescope. He thought the Apollo people could take a 20-inch telescope to the moon and set it up. That was rejected. Then he and a bunch of others uh, re uh, suggested a smaller one, and it was still a little bit outrageous, and that was uh, uh, rejected. And then, since he was an insider at NASA and knew of the still confidential proposals from everybody else, he said, well, I'll just use George Carruthers' camera. Oh, my God. Now, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a paranoia maven. I love, I love conspiracy and all sorts of stuff. Um, luckily, it's, it's edited out of my work when, when I publish. But... <laughs> I've got to go after this. I just, you know, th th this has got me going. And I'm, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about what happened. The fact was that NASA, uh, not routinely, but not unusually, put people together who proposed for the same things. And in the case of, of, um, of, of uh, Thornton Page, Page knew of Carruthers' proposal, knew that the proposal had been approved. Carruthers didn't know a thing about Page's interests. But Page wanted to do direct imaging, whereas Carruthers was doing spectra, two different instruments. Carruthers found a way to put them together and did so absolutely flawlessly. Here's a diagram of it. Uh, you basically have 
your plane grading down there, and if you tilt your electronographic Schmidt camera toward the plane grading, and it goes through the collimator, you get spectroscopy. If you keep it straight, uh, you get direct imaging. It's the same camera, wow. dual purpose. And it's something that since it only requires a 90 degree crank, even an astronaut in gloves can do it. Okay, so he also was very, very sensitive to what would work on the moon with an astronaut. Very important mm -hmm. parts here. And so there it is. Uh, the, two, the, 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 the spectroscopic part is the lower one. The direct is the upper one. Uh, you saw it just as he manipulated it and worked it. And this was approved. Uh, and then there was the question of who would be the PI and who would be the co-PI. You know what those things are. Technically in NASA, the person who builds the instrument is the co-PI. And the person who does the science with the instrument is the PI. So they put Page in as the PI. And, and um, uh, 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 George as the co-PI, but somehow that was reversed, and it also included Page leaving Marshall Space Flight Center and being hired at NRL. And I've got to get to the bottom of that. That's fascinating. Uh, not nefarious or anything, because Carruthers literally remained in control. So if something good was going on, and I think the name was Herbert Friedman, but I don't, I don't, have, the, I don't have the proof. It's a microchannel plate collimator? I, I would, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know for sure. Um, by then, they had microchannel plates, certainly, yeah. Okay, so there it is with one of his, um, George? George, where are you? Right here. I keep on forgetting the guy on the left. Do you know him? No, I don't know the guy on the left. Okay, if I can, I, he's in my notes, darn it. Well, right uh, we, oh, thank you. William Conway. See, you knew all along. Okay. Yeah, William, did you know the name William Conway? Yeah, and, and therein lies a very interesting thing. George Carruthers had a little more problem. The only time I said, you know, were there, did, did you ever, ever have any trouble getting people to do what you wanted at NRL? He said, well, the only problem was that I was a scientist. I was employed as a scientist, and that meant the engineers would do the work, kind of building everything. But I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that work too. And the engineers got ticked at me. So it was that kind of a fun dynamic. They also had uh, technical help, technicians as well. Oh, yeah. The Harry Merchant, I think, was one of those technicians. Who? Harry Merchant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will get that, I'll spill that name yeah, later. George wanted to do everything. You're right about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll talk. Yeah. Okay. So here's George instructing, and uh, I can't remember names of astronauts, but that guy looks like he's an astronaut. Um, <laughs> and it could be John Young for all I know. But these are PR shots uh, where they are uh, in a clean room uh, instructing the astronauts on how to use this equipment. Uh, here are, now here's, here's the thing to appreciate about astronauts. We think that they're a bunch of cowboys running around. Well, here are the experiments for Apollo 16. And you know, there it is, George Carruthers and Thornton Page, the far UV camera. But all of those others, the astronauts had to set up and develop and, you know, make sure they didn't interfere with one another. So when you see the PR pictures, oh, no, no, excuse me, sorry, here's the PR, wah, there. When you see the PR pictures, you know, you think they're having just a bunch of fun. And especially the one down here where John Young is saluting the flag. But right behind him, you can see the camera. He did not salute the flag on the first day. He didn't salute it on the second. He saluted it on the third, after they set the camera up, at least. So there, there is that to, to, to appreciate. And nobody was running around in the, uh, in the, in the, in the rover while the camera was uh, exposing, thank God. OK, well, go back here. Here's, now, here's some of the little issues with uh, who's getting credit for what. Certainly it was a local thing. This is a Hartford paper. Uh, Hartford Current, and uh, um, uh, 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 Thornton was, was from Wesleyan, and so it was a very close relationship there. And if you go through this particular article, uh, you, they mention Carruthers once being involved somehow, but you think that, that uh, uh, 
Thornton did it all. I wish that I could have interviewed Thornton Page about that and see what he thought about it. But this is the kind of thing that you, we, we have to guard against in the media, going, going overboard. But again, this is the sort of thing that's preserved. Uh, here is where they uh, landed, in the Descartes um, uh, Highlands, I believe it is. Um, but one of the toughest uh, moments in the whole mission uh, was that um, between April 16th and the 27th, and I think it was on the 20th, uh, when they were uh, in the process of landing, uh, there was a malfunction in the propulsion system for the, uh, uh, for, for the, for the lunar module, and it took some six hours uh, to finally straighten it out and so they could land it safely. Now, okay, so you landed it safely. That created a real problem for uh, Carruthers and for Thornton Page who were both in Houston, by the way, watching this and in real time trying to figure out how to do the following. What happens in six hours? The sun moves, right? I mean, the moon does rotate. Not much, but it does. And this camera had to operate in the darkness. So it had to be set up in the shadow of the limb so it didn't get direct sunlight. And then everything that they had programmed to observe the Earth and uh, one of the Magellanic clouds and stuff like that, they had to be visible. Well, six hours makes a difference. And so they were madly re recalculating where to tell the astronauts to point the camera. I mean, you saw John Young. Oh, yeah, I guess that's the Earth. I mean, that was, <laughs> you know, if he's surprised, point toward the small Magellanic cloud, John. <laughs> and, and, as, and, as, and as they all said, with those solar visors on, you can't see anything. So basically, they had to have the altitude and azimuth coordinates pre-programmed, and they had to send down a whole new batch to them, and, but it worked, it went out really, really well. Uh, so so it, it was quite a success story. There they are, uh, saluting, having fun. Um, yeah, this was the point where um, they'd still, uh, when I, I looked through the whole uh, uh, scenario, they deployed within a day. They deployed the camera. And considering everything else they had to do, that was pretty quick. And they got it there uh, and um, started observing. You can see that it's in the shadow. Here's the sky. Uh, where's that? Oh, here's the pointer. Um, it, was, it was all set up so that the Earth Here's the Earth, the 2M circle. That's where the Earth would be, at the vertical, as, as high in the sky as possible, as far away from any kind of, of um, uh, pollution. Uh, and the pollution could come from, oh, ah! Wait a minute, come on. Okay. Uh, the, the lunar geo, uh, geo or lunar corona, it was called, that 10M thing, or the, the, the limb, the blocked by the limb, that would be the part that would be the part of the shadow. So they had to calculate these things. Oh, the, also the solar bow cloud, that would be illumination from the sun's outer atmosphere. And also, see, they even put in the horizon. There's Stone Mountain and various other uh, mountains from, from that place. It was all pre-calculated. Not a casual program, I should say. Okay, well, uh, the, uh, the film canister was brought back. The camera is still on the moon, of course, but the little film canister that held all the film, that was taken out by the astronauts and put in a, put in a case like that, brought back, and uh, after some, uh, of course it was all pre-argued, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center was the one to develop the film, not the Naval Research Lab. And why that's the case, I'll, I'm, I'm looking into, but obviously they both knew how to do it. But after all of the processing was done, um, uh, NRL got the film canister back. There it is in the box uh, with, uh, with George and some of his colleagues at the Naval Research Lab. This was sort of a, a uh, um, momentous event for them. Here is uh, one of the primary images of the result showing the global distribution of, uh, of hydrogen and with, under different filters, uh, you see the global distribution of other uh, ions in the uh, upper atmosphere of the Earth. And you can acquaint this, uh, you equate this 
with other phenomena going on at the Earth, like aurora, uh, ionospheric um, uh, radio reflective properties and everything, which they were doing constantly at NRL and others at the same time. So it was the first global image of the Earth's geocorona. And here they are in, in different wavelength bands and resolutions. Those are indi indicative of, of auroral bands and of um, what you call, um, so what did Van Allen call those things? The um, auroral, no. uh, like vortices, extensions of, 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 of highly excited material high in the atmosphere, parts of the geocorona. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, a few years later, 10 years later, uh, the Smithsonian acquired what was left, still on Earth, of the lunar cameras. And um, I, was, I had a vague part to do with it. I, I was a, a junior curator at the time. But this was considered to be part of the collection of manned spaceflight, not science, uh, which was later thought to be a mistake. And so I now grabbed them. I got them all. Uh, but the thing was, the curator who, who acquired it didn't know what to do with it, so it sat for about uh, five years. Um, two of them were acquired. Uh, one of them I gave back to NRL so that they could exhibit it themselves, which they've done a great job on. Uh, and then we took uh, the one that we acquired and put it on the uh, lunar landscape. Now, there was a bit of an argument here. What is the problem? The problem is that this supposedly depicts uh, Apollo 11. That instrument came from Apollo 16. Um, we were hoping, I was hoping, that we would get some visitor comment and criticism. It was up for 10 years. Nobody said anything. Okay, so there you go. What are you going to do? But it was not in great shape. It, was, uh, it hadn't been restored. And in the 90, early 90s, I got the idea to ask George if he would help to restore it for us. And, and he agreed. Uh, using his students as, 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 as a team to learn about the instrument by restoring it. And that was a lot of fun. But then he went beyond that and he said, well, you know, we have, we have the camera that came back from the moon too. We didn't get that initially. Okay, that was, that was in their vault. And he said, why don't I donate that? Now, this is not a donation since the NRL is federal. And so what this is is a transfer. But you know, te technical stuff. But there it is, and we were just amazed that nobody thought about that. So this is, uh, so when you look at the camera, and you can't see it right now because the museum's being transformed, but when it's back on display in, in a few years, it has the camera in it that actually went to the moon, the cassette, I should say. But there's a problem, as there always is. Uh, we did the restoration. That's somebody that looks like me from 1992. Um, <laughs> put it together. This is uh, part uh, of the outtakes from the video. Um, he gave us a lot of documentation that we didn't have before on the instruments and how to maintain it. And then we took it off the uh, lunar lander scene, mainly because uh, it was in the open air and it was incorrect. You know, it wasn't Apollo 11 and blah, blah, blah. And we put it in a sealed container uh, in the Apollo to the Moon gallery. And um, that allowed people to look at it closer, and we had more labels, and I think it was a nice improvement. There was only one problem. After uh, about a year or so, when people would go in to uh, open up the case and go in to inspect to make sure there's no corrosion, they started smelling something. And it, it was the kind of smell of, of decomposing film. Oh, okay. Here you go. And I freaked out. Okay, thanks. And I freaked out. I said, oh my God, you mean there's film in it? <laughs> so uh, George, unfortunately, by then, this was 2014, uh, was no longer able to come over and help us. I mean, he was already um, uh, uh, in, in pretty difficult times. But his colleagues came over. And if you know their names, Okay, I have them somewhere, and I apologize. On the right is our, um, is our staff member who does uh, restorations. But the whole qu uh, question was, open it up and see what's in it. So over a series of very careful uh, operations, 
Uh, they, and of course they knew this, this cassette, these guys worked with him too, and they, they knew exactly what to do. They opened it up and it was empty. But there were, there was a little bit of residue in various places and that could have been from the original film. And they cleaned it and it's back, it will be back on display. But that was really uh, quite a time. We, we interviewed them in detail, we have a blog on this. Uh, it was sort of reliving the, uh, the moment. And it's just also an indication of how we try to care for these things. That's a piece flown to the moon, did some really great work, and it's back in our hands. Isn't that something? Uh, they did microscopic analysis, and there's all sorts of words that I don't understand and everything like that, but we now have a good sense of how to preserve it over the long term. Now, thinking about George, post, post the Apollo period, uh, he didn't rest on his laurels. Uh, of course, he didn't use that camera itself, but he used the basic design. And he redesigned it several times to use in, I would say, many more applications than we know of. We know that uh, one of his cameras flew on Skylab and, and examined Comet Kohotek. Another one of his cameras uh, flew and, and examined um, uh, Comet uh, well, Halley, Comet Halley. He had other um, he had other experiments uh, constantly developing, using his cameras in many, many different areas. And I'm now trying to get opened up the area at NRL, which was an operational area, where it was used for um, the analysis of very rapidly occurring uh, phenomena like sparks in various chambers or other things that NRL is concerned with. Just to give an idea of just how uh, how many different purposes this could be put to. And most importantly, George later on in the, in the 2000s, in the 1990s, late 90s, he started early in, 90, in the early 90s with this group of high school seniors and college kids, bringing them in, exposing them to, uh, to, to the laboratory. But then they, he started generalizing the program with this group called Project SMART, uh, where they were uh, uh, working on uh, helping the DC school system become more sensitive to uh, what we now call STEM, uh, STEM values for everybody, STEM for everyone, not just for the select. And um, he continued on that. He, he worked, uh, as he continued to work at, at NRL, he also became an adjunct professor at Howard and he continued working at Howard and I know that there were a number of star parties that he would always show up with one of his telescopes I would love to be able to collect one of his personal telescopes. And he continued doing that um, right up to uh, the time when uh, he was no longer uh, mobile. And the last time I think we we've, we've saw him in public uh, was when he uh, was awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation by uh, President Obama. Uh, if you watch the videos of the of this ceremony, I had ho hoped that uh, during the ceremonies that the winners would be allowed to say something. Well, no, none of them did. They all went up, shook, and sat down. And George did just fine. Okay. So thank you very, very much. And absolutely, if there's any questions, uh, uh, George Docek will, will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. make some comments on your because I was in solar physics. I wasn't directly involved in the lunar stuff. But uh, we all knew George. We were all coming in under the same program, and the same postdoctoral program. Right. George was sort of like uh, out, of, you know, out of sight. I mean, he was like phenomenal. He worked very long hours. And he prepared everything himself. Like mm -hmm. in those days, if we wanted to make a drawing for a paper, we'd sketch it out on, on, on graph paper. And then we took it to a, a technology information division, and it would go to a draftsman. And the draftsman would draw a figure and letter it, and would call us in to check it. This would take like a week. Then it would go to photography, and photography would make glossy prints of uh, figures. And these would be the ones that were sent to journals, most of the astrophysical journals. George did everything himself, except I don't think he took the picture, but he, he made the drawings. And he had a Leroy set that he would sit there and make all these drawings. Yeah. And we, we, uh, he just did this, and I think he probably typed his own papers. 
Yeah. We have secretaries in the duo, but it was yeah. before all that internet stuff. Yeah. So I think also, and I may be wrong about this here, a stack of astrophysical journals. He didn't open. He was always a sort of keeping busy, too busy just to sit down and read journals. They were just stacked up in his office, uh, unopened. I heard did that. You, did you hear about I've that? I've heard that, yes. But he was like phenomenal. We all thought, well, we'll never be able to do that. I mean, that's the way he was. I, and I, I got the same impression from people like Talbot Chubb yeah. and others who, when I did the first round of interviews right. in the late 80s, uh, they would always refer to George. And in fact, there was one uh, scene we were interviewing outside the building, and George <laughs> came by on his bicycle. Yeah. And they tried like anything to get him to stop and talk to us, but he wouldn't. He was on a mission. <laughs> you know, he was a friendly guy, but you're right. He was always, he was very, he was very busy. I, I don't think he would be a great network type person. To go on no, that. no, but he was always <laughs> extremely friendly. That kind of person. Yeah, he, um, he, he came to uh, the museum a lot later on uh, and um, uh, was always available for um, our uh, programs where uh, people would meet a scientist kind of a thing. He was always there. Um, and another piece of information that I have to verify is that uh, since I've been talking mainly with his wife over the last uh, year or so, uh, she says they met at the Air and Space Museum. <laughs> and when, when she sent me a picture of their, um, uh, after their wedding reception, it was at the Air and Space Museum. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> but thank you for that. Hey, was that recorded? Uh, the audio is. Good. Yeah. Excellent. I yeah. want it. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah. His cameras, did they use the hard vacuum you got for free in space, or were they free, uh, pre evacuated? Well, you're talking about the sounding rockets. No, no, the, um, the, lunar, the lunar camera and. Uh, they were, yeah, uh, they, they, were, they were in canisters that were uh, reduced uh, pressure, air pressure. Uh, but they weren't vacuum. It was closed. These were sealed on the ground in, with a very low pressure inside. They were, they were evacuated partially. Well, the camera itself had to be evacuated, right? The, the electron Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So that was just in the vacuum you got for free on the moment. That's right. But the it, film canister was partial. Uh, the film canister was, was also evacuated, I'm quite sure, yeah. Uh, when we looked at it, uh, they, they were showing us uh, little channels and stuff that kept everything <laughs> open. But you see, the, the, the film was not sensitive to uh, vis uh, visible, light. visible light. Right. Uh, right. And so then I asked, so how come they put it in the shadow? And the argument was, it's not completely insensitive. To uh, but if they wanted to keep it out of the solar, uh, far, far ultraviolet and, uh, uh, radiation, yeah. as much as and they the could. Would have blown it and oh, yeah, somewhere. right, right, exactly, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember all the long cameras and the disposable photocathodes. Oh God! Did you run into Lalamon cameras too? Yeah, I've seen references to it. Oh, okay. And on a, a trip to France, I asked oh, Thompson okay. Houston oh, okay. whether we could get it because our lab was very interested in that. And they sort of looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah, these promised and delivered well over 100 times mag uh, 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 increase in sensitivity. <coughs> Is that sort of the number? Yeah, because there were oh, other... Yeah. There it was... It, it was concept that predated the CCD. Oh, yeah. And achieved similar quantum efficiency. Exactly. Right, right, right. And, right. and there was, at the same time, there was a, a development called the, the silicon viticon. That's right. Labs That's right. That was using the picture phone. Mm -hmm. It also had a photocathode, uh, I'm sorry, not the picture phone, the, the, um, the digicon tubes. Hmm. So there were all kinds of developments. It used a photocathode and electronic imaging. Yeah. The history, I just uh, had a, a pre-doc get her degree uh, doing a history of uh, electronic imaging, pre-CCD. And also some of the colleagues have written on uh, the, the title of their 
um, uh, article is Replacing a Technology, How CCDs Replaced Vacuum Tube Technologies. It was a real revolution of our time, absolutely. And uh, the Ranger cameras yes. use that kind of intermediate technology. The intermediate technology. Like That's right. Well, so did the Lunar Orbiter, where uh, the image would, would be put on a screen <coughs> that was then scanned by a TV gun. And it, the big problem was getting the data back to Earth. And that was another reason why Carruthers' proposal was so amenable to the Apollo program. You needed humans. My God, give them a purpose. You know, I, I'm being nasty. I know, I know. Yeah. Any, yeah. George also got the Warner Prize for the discovery of H2 in the oh, astronomy. Right. Uh, right. That's a prize given by the American Astronomical right. Society for a good science for a young, sci a young scientist. A young scientist, yeah. yeah. Your early career. Early career science. Yeah, he certainly was recognized right away. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is there any, anybody else? Well, yes. Yeah, you, you may have come across, there's a children's book about him, a picture book that I, I saw at my um, elementary school. You're um, a kid. No. There, I want it. And maybe connected to Project <laughs> Smart, I'm not sure. Oh, but it, was one it could of those be. Nice books that had a picture on every page. Yeah. And it kind of very, um, sort of, it gave the science, but it gave it in a, um, a sort of understandable way that I can understand. Oh, I definitely am going to look for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I had one experience doing a children's book, and it was just wonderful uh, trying to do that. It was called uh, Pluto's Secret. Anybody ever see it? Yeah. It's, the, Pluto is very, very happy. We wrote it because kids were so sad about Pluto. Yeah. Yeah. Pluto, yeah. Was, and, and our book was, no, Pluto is really happy because it's finally been found out. It's been sitting there throwing us clues all these years, oh, and okay. humans finally figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, I, I'm, I'm available for the rest of the evening and for breakfast and stuff like that, but I'm afraid I have to get back and, and deal with the museum. Thank <laughs> you.